Well, good morning, friends. It is my pleasure and privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Mark Bailey, assumed the role of DTS Chancellor in July 2020 after serving 19 years as the fifth president of Dallas Theological Seminary, and he continues his role also as senior professor in the Bible Exposition Department. In addition to his 35 years at DTS, he has pastored various churches in Arizona and Texas. He's a published author and is in the demand Bible conference speaker and for other preaching engagements all over the country and all over the world. His overseas ministry have included Venezuela, Argentina, and Hungary, and China. He currently serves on the teaching team at Christ Chapel Bible Church in Fort Worth. He's been a regular tour leader in Israel, Jordan, Egypt, Turkey, Greece, and Rome. This makes me tired. <laughs> Are you sure you retired? That is the question. His current board service includes Bible Study Fellowship, Walk Through the Bible Ministries, Word of Life, International Alliance for Christian Education, and Steve Green Ministries. Not the Steve Green that was here yesterday. Dr. Bailey and his wife, Barbie, have two married sons and six grandchildren. Barbie is here today. Would you please join me in welcoming Barbie today? And I tell you what, I have been very privileged in my life to have uh, certain men pour into my walk of faith. And the man that is going to step up to this podium right now is one of those men. Would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Bailey today? Well, good morning. Let me add my word of welcome to those of you who are new uh, this semester. Uh, welcome to the adventure of a lifetime. Uh, you will leave with more questions than you came with, uh, but you'll also leave with the right answers to the questions that you ought to have. Uh, today, because of the topic, uh, we need to pray. So would you bow your heads with me and uh, join me in prayer? Father, uh, the words of uh, Paul, the apostle, are true for all of us who is adequate for these things. Uh, we are not here because we deserve to be here. We're here because of grace and your mercy. And as we talk about you, uh, we so easily talk about you without thinking rightly about you. And uh, we're instructed and convicted by all the responses of those people who had face-to-face uh, -face contact with you or your son that put them on their face and their knees. So uh, would you uh, make yourself bigger in our minds, magnify yourself so that we might magnify you and exalt you as we come together. And we ask for your help this morning. We're dependent upon you and you alone. Your son was right, and we don't always believe that without him we can do nothing. We often think it's just the big things that we need to come to you, but if we're honest, it's everything. As our beloved prof who's with you used to pray in front of us, our needs are not partial, but they're total. And we confess that to you this morning. So may your spirit be our teacher today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. A.W. Tozier wrote, no religion is ever greater than its idea of God. And no life is greater than its understanding of God. It's good to know the promises of God and it's good to know the program of God, but these are only meaningful to the extent that you and I get to know his person. To expand on a line from another A.W., this is not Root Beer Chapel, but A.W. Pink said, an unknown God can neither be trusted with the heart served with the life, or worshiped in truth. The original sin in the garden began with a perversion of the knowledge of God, a doubting of his word, a denial of his promises, and the questioning of his character. When we fail in our lives or when there's failure in our churches, it's because of a basic misunderstanding of God. Left to ourselves, we tend to reduce God to manageable terms, which ultimately results in meaningless ritual. Listen to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40 says this, to whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? 
As for an idol, a craftsman casts it and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects a wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? And a few verses later, he says, to whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Tozer continues, wrong ideas about God are not only the fountain from which polluted waters of idolatry flow, they are themselves idolatrous. One contemporary observer states, strange today, that men, and I might add, and women, still try to change what God has done, alter who he is, and rewrite what he has said. Zophar asked Job, can you find out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limit of the Almighty? It is higher than heaven, what can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Its measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. When you do a study of the Old Testament, there are four main reasons for which praise is due to our God. He's worthy of praise for his name, that's his identity, that's who he is. His attributes, those are what reflect his character, that's what he's like. His actions, these are his ways, how he works. And then a fourth one that we don't often think about enough is his incomparability. God is absolutely unique. There is no one like him. This morning as we begin this semester, I, I wanna raise the flag and therefore our eyes upward to salute the nature of God's incomparability. And I can't think of a better text from which to do this than Romans chapter 11 at the last portion. The context of Romans 11 is the grand climax of how God is, has worked, is working, and will work in history to accomplish his saving purposes both for Jews as well as Gentiles. And while it comes at the end of chapters nine through 11, that great section on Israel's election, rejection and future selection, as we'll see, it's a fitting conclusion and a transition of all that God has revealed in the first 11 chapters of Romans. A flyover, Romans one to three, 20 is condemnation, righteousness is needed. 321 to 521 is justification, righteousness provided. Romans 6 through 8 is sanctification, righteousness empowered. Romans 9 to 11 is vindication, righteousness demonstrated. And 12 through 16 is the application, extended application, righteousness practiced. From 116 through 1132, we have this grand gospel narrative presentation that the power of God for salvation is rooted in that good news that's available first to the Jew and then to the Greeks. It's the mystery of the whole Bible. It's that mystery of divine contingency and human consequence. God is sovereign even in his sequencing, first with Israel, then the Gentiles, and then again, as chapter 11 reveals, back with Israel. Romans 11.32 and Romans 12.1, if you look in your Bibles, are bookends of mercy between which the magnitude of God is to be appreciated. In Romans 11.32, he comes to the end of that discussion and in essence summarizes the whole book in, uh, up to this point when he says this, for God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. In the context, not all without exception here, but all without distinction. It's not universalism, it's that Jew, Gentile alike are available for God to save. The NIV says, for God has bound everyone over to disobedience. The, the verb is uh, sukleo. NASB says he shut up all in disobedience 
The Holman or the Christian Standard Bible says he's prisoned, imprisoned them all in disobedience. That word is found here and in two other places in Galatians 3, 22 and 23. It's the same word that basically the argument in Romans like in Galatians 3 is that both Jews and Gentiles, that's us, have been arrested and charged for being sinful, condemned as guilty, sentenced to lifelong imprisonment and death. If any of us, if anyone ever is released to freedom, it is because of the mercy of God and the merit of Christ alone, a gift of grace received by faith. We were born in prison, condemned to death. And if we've been released, it has been no merit of our own, but it's been the grace of God as a gift of God through Jesus Christ alone that we get to receive simply by faith. In verses 33 to 36, Paul transitions from the works of God to the worship of God, from the plan of God to the praise of God. Paul is moved from pondering the grace of God to praising the glory of God. In a nutshell, Paul moves from theology to doxology. That's my prayer for you in each of your classes, that what you learn would uh, find root in your heart and ultimately produce worship in your spirit. In these verses of 33 to 36, this grand doxology that finishes this section, we have three expressions, three questions, and three declarations. First, the expressions. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. His mind, his reasoning, his ways. God knows more and thinks better than any of his creation. The word depth speaks of volume. The word riches speaks of value. One is quality, the other is quality. How much does God know? How well does he think? That leads us to the second, and that's the judgments and the decisions of God are made out of the depths of his wisdom and knowledge. If those are uh, beyond fathoming, they're also therefore beyond questioning. Third, try, try uh, try as one might, why God does what he does will not be fully known here and now. The ways or paths of God are incapable of being traced. God leaves no footprints. We have no reason to question his will or his ways. We can't go as deep as God knows. We can't uh, uh, plumb the depths of what God knows, and we can't travel as far as God goes. Kohelet, the preacher in Ecclesiastes 8, says it this way, Then I saw all that God had done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all of his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he really can't comprehend it. Paul marvels at how deep and rich God's wisdom is, especially in the context in reference to his dealings with Israel and the nations. If you find yourself struggling to understand and accept God's sovereignty and human responsibility, you're exactly where God wants you to be. He wants you, however, to be honest and humbled by your human limitation, to stand in awe of his mercy that anyone, including you and including me, could ever be saved. The question is, are you comfortable with not knowing all that God knows? Are you willing to let God always be God. When you come to understand that God is right, even if you don't want him to be in certain circumstances, he's still righteous and justice. Reminds me of the middle of that discussion in Romans chapter nine on the sovereignty of God and his election of Israel and others. 
When he answers, you might try and find fault with God if you're not careful. And he asks a very pointed question. Who are you, O man, who answers back God? It could be translated, who are you, O man, who sasses God? Do you have that big of a picture of God? To magnify God means to uh, make him bigger so that you can see him better. And to exalt him, as Psalm 34 tells us, Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Exalt means to lift up. We want to make him look bigger and better so that we can lift him up higher in recognition of who he is. Paul now justifies these statements of God's wonder with three rhetorical questions. He asks, beginning in verse 34, who has known the mind of the Lord? Rhetorical questions are those that are intended to be answered internally, not audibly, but uh, they leave us no question as to what the implication is. Or who has been his counselor? Or who has ever given to God that God should repay them? These questions, as you see in some of your Bibles, because of the print or the footnotes or the marginal notes, these are quotes from Isaiah and Job. Listen to Isaiah chapter 40. Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? And then in Job 41.11, who has a claim against me that I must pay, God asks, everything, everything under heaven belongs to me. The order listed seems to reflect a literary pattern of an inverted parallelism where the statements are uh, uh, on the outside and then they move themselves inside, sort of in an X pattern. And so when you look at that and and, uh, marvel at that, A and A prime on the outside, riches and repayment, God is so rich in all that he is and all that he has and all that he does, he owns it all, If God can be that rich, then no one can prepay something to God to obligate him to repay. No one can ever put God in his debt. God owes no one anything. E.H. Gifford writes in his commentary, the apostle here once more touches the root of Jewish error, the self-righteous notion of earning God's favor by previous merit. B and B prime are the wisdom set off with the word who has been his counselor. What could you and I ever bring to the table to help God cope? (laughs) That, That would assume that God has a problem. And even the question is a conviction enough for us to just shut up. Times we pray like, God, you just don't know. (laughs) Oh yeah, you're omniscient. C and C is knowledge in the mind of God. God speaks through Isaiah when he asks, when he echoes this same thought, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, without the revelation of God, we would never know the mind of God. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever. Why? That we may do all the words of this law. You see, you and I need God's word to understand God's mind, to function in God's world. I remember when I first came on the faculty, Ray Stedman, who was a board member at the time, pastored for 40 years at the Peninsula Bible Church in Palo Alto, California. He, uh, some people don't know, was a bull rider from Wyoming, came to Dallas Seminary. Chuck Swindoll interned under him. Bill Lawrence interned under him. Ray Stedman had interned under uh, J. Vernon McGee. And Ray Stedman said this, because he didn't have a college degree. He came as a certificate student, came through Dallas Seminary, bright guy. And God, in his humorous sovereignty, put him on the doorstep of Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. In a uh, 
what has been uh, called Harvard West by some. He said the humor was uh, all these people with such knowledge. But he said, I soon realized that with all of their knowledge, they didn't know how to connect it to God and therefore lacked wisdom. And therefore he wasn't intimidated to spend 40 years without a college degree, with good training at Dallas Seminary, opening the word of God and ministering for 40 years on the uh, doorstep, so to speak, of Stanford University. That's how God works. D and D are his judgments, D and D primer, his judgments and his paths. And this is the centerpiece, his wisdom and his ways. He has unsearchable reasons and he has untrackable roots. Here are just a few from this book, think about it. How does God think, how does God act? How the righteousness of God exposes the depravity of sin and justifies the condemnation of every one of us. How the mercy and grace of God is an expression of his infinite love. How being justified, declared righteous in his sight is to be a gift received by faith alone and not the wage of human merit. How one can choose to live righteously through identification with Christ and in dependency upon the indwelling Holy Spirit. How nothing on earth or in heaven can reverse our salvation or ever separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. How God can work across the ages and the pages of scripture to choose a people to teach other people that even through their rejection, God brings people to himself all to God's glory. Only God can do this. Marvelous as it is and mysterious as it is. And that leads us to three climactic declarations. Three dramatic, dynamic declarations. He says, for of him, literally out of him, Hati ek atu, that's origin, that's source. We just sang about it in that chorus. Di atu, through him, he's the agent, and hence he's the sustainer. And ace autan ta panta, and unto him, or for him, are all things. He's origin, he's agent, and he's goal. He's source, he's sustainer, and therefore, he is the one who's significant. When you put it in the theology of salvation in Romans, he's the one who started it all, he's the author of our faith, he's the justifier, he's the sanctifier, and he'll be the glorifier. If all things are from God, God does not owe us. If all things are through him, God does not need us or especially our counsel. If all things are to him, God's plans for the future cannot be questioned. But beyond everything else, God is glorified. When you and I as finite creatures realize that God alone possesses infinite wisdom and knowledge, and instead of rejecting, questioning, or arguing with him, you and I simply bow in worship, thanksgiving, obedience, and praise. God does not need to be adjusted. God only needs to be trusted. Because he's the source of all things, all things are from him. They originated from him, whatever else the theory of evolution might explain or try to purport to explain. The one thing it does not even attempt to explain is the absolute origin of matter, energy, or life. It cannot hope to do so because God is the source. He's the sustainer. All things are through him. Colossians 1.17 puts in uh, the same thought in different words. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Acts 17 says, in him we live and move and have our being. If God for one split second were to take his sovereign hand off this world, we would simply dissolve, self-destruct. All things are held by his almighty hand. Thirdly, all things are to him. He's the end, the significance of everything. 
every star, every planet, every mountain, every stream, every flower, every creature, every person is ultimately been designed, as Revelation tells us, to bring glory to God. And he's even able to make the wrath of men praise him, according to Psalm 76. The conclusion is to him, to him, be the glory forever. Amen? I love the way Cranfield concludes this section in his commentary. Listen to it. He says, so the discussion of chapters 9 through 11 comes to its natural and fitting conclusion in a doxology. Paul has certainly not provided neat answers in a baffling, of baffling questions which arise in connection with the subject matter of these three chapters. He has certainly not swept away all the difficulties. But if we have followed him through these chapters with serious and open-minded attentiveness, we may well feel that he has given us enough to enable us to repeat the amen of his doxology in joyful confidence, listen to this, that the deep mystery which surrounds us is neither a nightmare mystery of meaninglessness nor a dark mystery of arbitrary omnipotence, but the mystery which will never turn out to be anything other than the mystery of the altogether good and merciful and faithful God. My brother-in-law, Steve Green, not the Steve Green from yesterday, but my wife's brother, wrote and recorded a song called God and God Alone. Listen to the words as I close. God and God alone created all things we call our own. From the mighty to the small, the glory in them all is God and God's alone. God and God alone is fit to take the universe's throne. Let everything that lives reserve its truest praise for God and God alone. God and God alone reveals the truth of all we call unknown. And the best and worst of men won't change the master's plan. It's God's and God's alone. God and God alone will be the joy of our eternal home. He will be our one desire. Our hearts will never tire of God's and God's alone. Stuart Briscoe finished his comments on this. It is he who originated us in order that he might perpetuate us so that when he is ready, he might terminate us for as far as this life is concerned. As the one from whom we came, we know him as source. As the one who keeps us alive in every dimension, we recognize him as the force. And because it is to him that we are inexorably moving, we gladly acknowledge him as the course of our lives. It is surely to him that our glory rightly belongs. Let's pray. Father, human words are not adequate but they're a feeble attempt for us to remind ourselves from your word that you are God and we are not. So as our, my good friend Ray Pritchard reminds us, we ought to take the G off our sweatshirts. It's your world, it's your wisdom, it's your way that we need to recognize, gain, understand, and follow. So I pray for my fellow faculty members and administration, staff members and students, that this would be a year in which uh, they get a bigger view of you so they can see you better and that we could lift you higher and rightly give our praise, our adoration, our thanksgiving and our obedience to you. You are why we are here and why we exist. Help us never forget it's for you because of who you are, because of how you are, because of your great name that tells us so much about you and because no one is like you. 
and for that we're grateful. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.